So good morning, everyone. Falcha August Madinva. So I'm Alison Turnbull. I'm Director of External Relations and Partnerships at Historic Environment Scotland. And I'm just going to run through some housekeeping to start today's event. So thanks to all the team at Dynamic Earth for their help getting us set up. I just wanted to make you aware of a few program changes at the moment. So Caroline Clark will be monitoring the discussion session, not Lucy Cassett. And Irene McCarran McWilliam is also not with us. And so we're going to have five speakers for the moderation session. We've also had some changes to the breakout groups and Dara Parsons will be facilitating, not Stephen Duncan. So we're going to be using Slido this morning for the open discussion session, and this will be active throughout the event. And would really like to get your questions, thoughts, observations. So on this screen over here, you will see the joining instructions for Slido, but you were also emailed these out last week. And the event code is hashtag chef, and you can join by typing in the event code into the blue participation box on the Slido homepage. You don't need to register for Slido, but you'll be prompted to add your name. And I'd also wanted to say the plenary part this morning up until coffee at 11.15 is being live streamed on YouTube. So I just wanted to welcome our online participants now and say, can you participate via Slido? Because we'd love to incorporate your thoughts as well. And we'll have a recording available on YouTube after today. For those of you who tweet and um, post on various social media, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag our place in time. And this is the hashtag for the strategy review. So if you can continue to use this after the event. There'll be a coffee break from 11.15 to 11.45 in the place two floors up where we had coffee before coming in. And um, after the break, you'll be moving into a facilitated session. So you should have already been given details of your facilitation group and location, but these, the information is also posted on boards around the venue. And if there's any further confusion, we've got event staff who will help um, place you in the right group. So any questions, ask a member of the event team. The facilitated session will last for an hour. And then after that, we'll come back into this room for next steps, a bit of a summary, and then we'll be having lunch two floors above where you registered. So you might have already noticed there are some materials around the place which to get designed to gather your thoughts. So any ideas you have that are not covered, either in Slido or in the discussion groups, could you please write them down? So after all that housekeeping, we can get on with the program for today. And I'm delighted to introduce, here's his new chair, Dr. Hugh Hall. Thanks. Morning all. I'm going to take my jacket off because it's a bit warm uh, in here. Um, anyway, delighted to, to see you all and uh, to welcome you to this chef. Uh, forum that kicks off the review of the Our Place and Time uh, strategy. A warm welcome to all of you and thank you uh, for giving up your valuable time uh, to be here. Uh, this is going to be very much a collective endeavour over the next uh, several uh, months as we undertake the review. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm delighted to be uh, joining uh, Historic Environment Scotland Board as chair at, at this time. I took up post at the end of January. I've already been out and about enjoying uh, some of the sites and so on. I've got a full pro program over the summer. Um, and uh, yeah, I, joining at a very challenging time, but I think also joining at a time when we've got opportunities in abundance. I think we've learned a lot over the last couple of years uh, and we, we want to put that to, to, to very good use. So um, let's take the time today to, to, to um, you know, throw out ideas, think about the, 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 these challenges that we have uh, before us, but also think about the opportunities. A wee bit of out the box uh, uh, thinking. Anyway, the, the historic environment uh, helps to connect us uh, to the past and to each other. It's all around us, our places of work, where we live uh, and where we choose to spend our leisure time. It is also in our music, arts, traditions and stories. Uh, the historic environment is also vital to our future and our shared ambition to 
create a fairer and greener Scotland for people of all ages today and for future uh, generations. Uh, the breadth of organisations, sectors and interests represented here today and uh, in the room and, and online is a testament to the reach and importance of the historic environment. It connects to many policy areas like the natural environment, biodiversity, construction, tourism, housing, education and skills. We have representatives from organisations in all of these sectors here today. We do recognise that these are challenging and uncertain times for the sector and for the country. The pandemic has hit us all hard and we are still feeling its effects on our workforce, revenues, supply chains. The situation has been exacerbated by the ongoing impacts of EU exit and the terrible war in Ukraine. The pandemic and the growing cost of living crisis has served to highlight and indeed increase inequalities in our society, making it harder but more imperative that we redouble our collective efforts to address this. For all of us, this also means increasing our efforts to grow our knowledge and understanding of our past and uncover those diverse stories and evidence that make up Scotland's heritage. This is central to understanding and, and valuing the historic environment, and it is central to the actions we take to address inequality and unfairness, past, present and future. We can all also witness the impacts of the climate emergency on all our lives, on our historic places and their local communities, and the costs and other challenges that these create. These and other challenges facing the historic environment will no doubt be brought out today. I'm sure we will also be identifying, as I said, uh, the, 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 the many opportunities that this brings. Scotland's uh, Historic Environment Forum has been established as a forum for leaders and policymakers to come together to help set the strategic direction for our sector, to share insights on the key challenges and opportunities that we face as a sector and as a country. This today is a joint Scottish Government and HES event. Today, we are seeking your views and insights on what a new Our Place and Time strategy will look like. The, the, the current Our Place and Time strategy was published some eight years ago in 2014. It was Scotland's first strategy for the historic environment. It was developed by the sector, for the sector, and has been integral to our sector's work and success over the last few years as well as ensuring in line, alignment to government and UN sustainability development goals. Working together, we have published a guide to climate change impacts in 2019. Also in 2019, we published the first historic environment uh, sector skills investment plan. That was a joint effort by Skills Development Scotland, the Scottish Government and Historic Environment Scotland. And that will support, has been supporting the many partners uh, that led to a great range of activity across a number of areas, focusing on attracting future talent, improving access and pathways into the sector, mainstreaming traditional building skills, archaeology skills and training, and heritage tourism. We have also worked together to produce uh, a sustainable investment toolkit, which we hope to see published very soon. And we have seen the creation of the Make Your Mark volunteering participation campaign, which will be vital to restoring and then growing volunteer opportunities and numbers in our sector. A, a, a good range of achievements and, and, and many more. None of what has been achieved or that is underway now would be possible without our partners across the sector and our partners in, in, in other sectors. I'm delighted that so many, many of you and your, your organisations are represented here today. But the world has changed since Our Place and Time's publication back in 2014, and the strategy needs to be reviewed to ensure that it's fit for the future. HES has been commissioned to lead that review by the Scottish ministers, but this must be a collaborative process to ensure that we create an ambitious strategy that works for you, for the sector, and importantly for the people of Scotland. As we embark on the process of reviewing our place and time, we want to gather your insights, learn from you, and identify priorities for the next five years. So let me tell you how today will work. 
Uh, we will shortly hear an opening speech from the Minister for Culture, Europe and International Development and the Minister with Special Responsibilities for Refugees from Ukraine, Neil Gray, MSP. An open session will follow where a number of invited speakers will help to stimulate discussion. Uh, Lucy Cassett, Chief Executive of Museums Galleries Scotland uh, and a member of the Our Place and Time CEOs Forum, will be moderating what will be, I'm sure, a very interesting uh, discussion. Then following a, a break, we will all join a facilitated breakout session covering climate emergency, net zero and environment, economic recovery, resilience and sustainability, education, skills and young people, and community and tackling inequalities. That sounds like a really packed agenda. Uh, so we're, we're really going to be working you hard today. Um, uh, so today is our first event in the strategy review process. There'll be more engagement and more opportunities to input over the coming months. And Alec will cover that at the closed session today. Um, so we hope that everyone here today will continue to input to the strategy uh, uh, development. It's a really exciting time. Uh, this is a time to be carrying out this review and, and, and setting the direction uh, uh, for Scotland. So thanks once again to you all for being here today and for giving up your time. Uh, we hope you find the day interesting and stimulating. And we are also very grateful to our speakers, facilitators and others, including the HES team supporting today's event. I'm certainly looking forward to a, an exciting debate. How fortunate am I, you know, this, this early in my time as chair to have uh, an event like this. So I'll be doing the rounds and, 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 and listening in. And please do chat to me during the course of today as well, because I'm very much in learning mode. So anyway, without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to welcome Minister Neil Gray, MSP, to the stage. Neil. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Hugh. My challenge is always to try to say my ministerial title in one breath. Um, I think it's the longest job title uh, in politics. I greatly uh, appreciate your, your introduction, Hugh, uh, and outlining why we are all uh, gathered here today. And, and good morning uh, to you all. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be able to speak to you today uh, at uh, Scotland's Historic Environment Forum. Uh, this event uh, provides the perfect opportunity for, uh, for us to come together to discuss the priorities for the historic environment as we emerge from the pandemic. Uh, priorities such as economic recovery, climate change and skills. It's therefore fitting that this event takes place here in Dynamic Earth, one of Edinburgh's top visitor attractions, a venue committed to teaching its visitors about the effects of climate change and inspiring young people to engage in the environmental science. Uh, since my appointment as Minister for Culture, Europe, International Development and Minister for Special Responsibility for Refugees from Ukraine, uh, I am grateful that it has afforded me uh, the opportunity to visit uh, so many uh, of our unique uh, cultural and historic sites. There could be no doubt that for a nation of its size, Scotland certainly has a diverse uh, and impressive wealth of heritage and culture from its internationally renowned world heritage sites and major archaeological locations to smaller local community heritage projects. But we must never take them for granted. These precious assets require collaborative action to ensure they remain protected and sustainably operated for future generations to enjoy. This collaboration must not only come from the Scottish Government and Historic Environment Scotland, but from a broad spectrum of stakeholder groups and organisations, many of whom join us here today. This collaborative approach is perfectly evidenced in our place in time. The 10-year Historic Environment Strategy for Scotland, which, as Hugh said, was launched in 2014. As you'll be aware, this strategy raised the profile of the historic environment, aligning activity across a range of public and third sector bodies, increasing the impact and broadening the contribution of the historic environment to other policy agendas. And I think we would all agree that our place in time has had a positive impact on the awareness and perceptions of the priorities for the historic environment sector, both within the sector and outside. It provided a framework around which has and stakeholders aligned strategic planning and developed other strategies. However, 
the, stra the strategic context has changed considerably since Our Place in Time was published in 2014. COVID has and continues to have uh, negative impacts across all sectors on a global scale. But if there is a silver lining, it is that it has made people more aware and more appreciative of the nature of their habitat, of what is in, around them in their communities. And during the pandemic, people started rediscovering heritage in their local areas, and we must encourage this to continue. Going forwards, we have to prioritise activity that supports recovery and renewal. We must focus and uh, turn our focus to creating a more resilient and sustainable sector. We need to communicate the contribution that the historic environment uh, makes to the economy, well-being, and also to net zero. Uh, to this end, I recently commissioned HES to undertake a review of our place in time, which will prioritise activity that supports recovery and renewal. And the review will focus on creating a more resilient and sustainable sector. It will help us to promote the positive contribution that the historic environment makes to Scotland's economy and to the well-being of Scotland's people. Uh, today, we have an opportunity to redefine the context and set the direction for the review of the historic environment strategy. To achieve this, we need to provide clear strategic direction and a strong lead around prioritisation. I'm confident that by sharing our ideas, pooling our knowledge, we'll be able to respond to the threats presented to Scotland's heritage in a more comprehensive and consistent way. We must work collaborative, collaboratively to address the challenges ahead, but we cannot do this uh, in isolation. One sector alone cannot achieve this and we must work uh, with other areas to deliver our common objectives. Uh, with all of this in mind, there is much for us to discuss and certainly an area we must address and discuss is skills. Uh, from its launch, Our Place in Time recognised that a skilled workforce was crucial for the future needs of the sector. A lack of appropriate skills is a threat which could impact on the management, protection and conservation of the historic environment. The need to address skills gaps within the historic environment sector has become an even more important and uh, pressing uh, area of concern. We're all too aware of the high level masonry issues we face as a result of worsening uh, climate change. We need traditional building skills to maintain and retrofit our traditional buildings if we are to achieve our net zero targets and maintain our building stock. I met last week with uh, my colleague, Jamie Hepburn, the Minister for Higher uh, and Further Education, Youth Employment and Training. Uh, I highlighted there the needs to invest in training to ensure we have the traditional skills required to achieve net zero and I'll continue to engage with Jamie on these matters. Uh, when we discuss uh, climate change, it's important that our historic buildings are not seen as a barrier to delivering effective uh, climate action. We should instead focus on the solutions our traditional buildings can present uh, to support our transition to net zero and the ambitious delivery programmes proposed in the heat and buildings strategy. Indeed, we're only a very short walk away from Holyrood Lodge, which I had the pleasure, I had the pleasure of uh, visiting myself recently. There I witnessed uh, firsthand the latest techniques uh, for conserving traditional buildings uh, to help increase energy efficiency uh, and weather resistance. I saw how well a maintained and retrofitted traditional building it can improve energy efficiency and lower carbon emissions. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, Scotland has a diverse heritage and we need to reflect this uh, in our discussions. We can do this by focusing on our communities and the benefits of putting more control of the historic environment into local hands. Uh, the Isle of Gia is an inspiring example of community strength and self-sufficiency. Located off the west coast of Kintyre, forming part of Argyll and Butte, the island was put on the market for sale uh, in 2001. With the help of, with, of the Scottish Land Fund and Highlands and Islands Enterprise, the community was able to secure the island for £4 million in 2002. However, a condition of the grant meant that they had to pay back a million pounds of the grant to the Scottish Land Fund within two years, uh, with 200,000 pounds to be raised through their own fundraising efforts. Quite the task for a community with a population of about 100 at the time. Uh, since the community buyout, the island has seen new houses built, new businesses established, the wind turbines erected. 
uh, and in income from the renewable energy generated by the turbines is invested back into the community and the Isle of Gia is thriving with a growing population and a sustainable local economy. Supported by Historic Environment Scotland, the island is restoring Ackermore Gardens as an important part of its heritage. Gia is a clear example of recovery and renewal with subsequent economic benefits. And I'm sure when we discuss the recovery of the historic environment sector, we can reflect on the successes like the Isle of Gia. As many of you will be aware, before the pandemic, the historic environment sector contributed over four billion pounds a year to Scotland's economy. It clearly, the pandemic has and continues to have an impact on the economic performance of the sector. However, let me be clear that the Scottish Government continues to recognise the important contribution that the culture and heritage sectors can and will deliver to our economy, to our journey to net zero and to our health and well-being. We will therefore continue to provide funding to support these key areas. As a government, we are committed to being a good global citizen and to playing our part in tackling global challenges, including COVID-19, climate change, poverty, injustice and inequality. Our recent resource spending review continues to support that important work as we recover from the pandemic. And the resource uh, spending review supports us to make Scotland an open and welcoming nation for people and their families to live, work and make a positive contribution to our nation. Uh, against the chan challenging financial backdrop, we will invest approximately £230 million a year in Scotland's culture and historic environment to ensure our diverse and world-class cultural scene and rich heritage continues to thrive. We recognise the important role that the culture and historic sectors and heritage sectors play in health and well-being and will continue to provide funding to support these key areas. We will support HES to maintain Scotland's heritage, culture and identity with direct positive impacts on the nation's health and well-being and we will continue to support Creative Scotland and our world-class museums, collections and national performing companies. Uh, summing up my message to you today, uh, together we must thrive uh, and drive the historic environment sector's recovery to deliver not only the clear economic benefits but also to maintain and protect this nation's heritage for future generations to enjoy. Make no mistake, this is no easy task. Uh, however, when I look at the faces around the room today, I'm more than confident that we uh, have the right expertise, drive and ambition to deliver our renewed and uh, reviewed strategy for the historic environment. The original Our Place in Time was about coming together and working together and partnership and collaboration. And it will be even more important as the strategy is refreshed. Finally, I would like to conclude by expressing my thanks to Historic Environment Scotland and my officials in the Scottish Government for organising today's event. And I thank everyone here today for your commitment and support for Scotland's historic environment sector. Uh, unfortunately, because of other ministerial responsibilities today, I'm, I'm unable to stay for the whole event, but I trust that you will have a productive and informative time. I would now like to hand over to uh, Caroline Clark, uh, the Director for Scotland uh, with the National Lottery Heritage Fund. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for those um, insightful words. The challenges that face us at the moment are not small, but I think that this next session, where we get to hear a bit more about the wider context that we'll be working in, not, not only what we as a sector need, but what we as a sector can do to support the rest of society as we emerge from COVID is a really valuable starting point for our discussions today and um, as we carry on for the rest of the consultation period around our place and times refreshed strategy. So if I can um, first of all invite our speakers to come in and sit up here. Um, we're going to hear a series of lightning talks from a selection of fascinating speakers who are all going to bring diverse perspectives um, to the sector, whether it's from how we might consider a human rights approach to our work, um, to climate change, skills development and, and others. So um, this should be a really, really good broad jumping off point for our discussions later on today. 
After the speakers have um, given their talks, there'll be an opportunity for you, the audience, to participate through either asking questions through the Slido technology, or I will also be keeping an eye out just for the old-fashioned um, raised hands, and um, we'll, we'll also put your questions forward to our panel. Now, I think um, we are... Is there, a, is there another slide coming up? Um, because I know that Beths and Hez have been working very hard recently doing a, a synthesis of key strategy documents that um, support, the, um, support the work of OPIT. Um, and through that analysis, have come up with um, particular themes that are emerging from those strategy documents um, from the last few years. And those particular themes really chime with the minister's um, comments around collaboration, well-being, inclusion, and reflect the need for us to consider that in our discussions today and in our thinking about how we um, move forwards with refreshed um, our place and time work. So without further ado, um, so I think the word cloud is not going to appear that we were expecting at this point. Um, if I could introduce our first speaker, Aidan, Aidan Grisewood, the Director of Economic Policy for Scottish Government. Um, since March, Aidan's been responsible for overseeing the delivery of the National Strategy for Economic Transformation. Um, he's an eco economist by background, um, has done a whole range of diverse senior roles from housing, rail, tax, primary care during COVID and the circular economy. So I'm sure we'll have um, some fascinating insights to share with us today. Over to you, Aidan. Great. Thanks, Caroline. And delighted to be here. Um, I've got five minutes lightning talk and apparently I get a, a sharp cut off at the end. So I'll keep it, keep it brief. Um, Really pleased to, to be contributing in a small way to today, um, but as Caroline said, also it's great to um, really hear about you know you wanting to contribute to the economy and the economic strategy as well. I think it's a really good alignment in timing as well. Um, so as Caroline said, the strategy, the economic strategy for 10 years published in March, and here you are reviewing your strategy um, published back in 2014, thinking for the 10 years ahead, I assume. Um, so a real good opportunity to align what we're doing and what you're doing and sort of become mutually reinforcing. Um, so in terms of the economic strategy, it's built on five pillars. So those are skills, um, productive regions, new markets, particularly thinking about that transition to net zero, um, enterprise and an entrepreneurial mindset, and fairness. And it's a, a broad holistic strategy. So unsurprisingly, it does focus on key economic indicators of success, GDP, Things, you, the, things like that you'd expect, but also that broader approach. So thinking about well-being and the well-being economy and a set of indicators to measure progress, um, sustainability, um, but also fairness and equality too. Um, so just by way of background, I, I had a little look yesterday evening at, at both um, our place in time, but also the annual report, um, just to see what alignment was there already. And I saw quite a lot, so I saw some good things. Um, I saw the contribution that the um, um, historic environment makes to the economy, 4.4 billion apparently in 2019. It's, it's um, fallen away because of COVID since, but I'm sure we'll come back. So that was great to see. Um, I saw the focus on skills investment and the minister mentioned that earlier too. So a real key building block for the strategy. Um, I saw back in 2014, actually, you were already talking about well-being, um, head of the game. So really that focus on well-being which as I said, is a key part of the overall strategy. And it's really great to see how the links have been made with things like natural capital and really thinking about um, our collective assets in those spaces and how we get the most out of them. Um, the work with local authorities on strategic investment plans and city growth strategies and all of that. So I think that was a really positive thing to see and something to build upon. So really making great places both to attract people, but also to attract investment and support our economy. I saw all the work done about carbon reduction within the sector of the estate. Um, and also it's really encouraging to see those thinking about circular economy approaches. So think about the national planning framework, think about retrofitting, think about maintaining assets and um, reducing our carbon footprint, um, but also making sure that we're making best use of existing assets and supporting a circular economy. So all of those things struck me as really positive things to build on. I guess just in terms of challenges, and we mentioned this earlier, the last few months have seen quite a few in the economic, um, in, in the economic sphere. Um, 
we've seen EU exit and the consequence of that um, manifest itself. We've also seen the tragic war in Ukraine and the impact that's been having on supply chains, um, but also skill shortages and costs. So all of these things must be hitting the sector hard now and needing, needing people to really think about efficiencies, to think about prioritization. Um, and that financial challenge isn't necessarily going to go away. Um, the spending review announced only a few weeks ago by uh, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Economy set out the spending envelope going forward over the next few years. And that can change budget to budget, but nonetheless, the outlook is really challenging in terms of the overall spend that the government is going to be, put, be, going to be able to put into this sector as well as other sectors. And there'll be difficult decisions about priorities and therefore economic impacts being an important thing to think about in terms of making a case. So in all of that, I think a couple of strands of this strategy might be helpful to think about. So one might be new markets, um, thinking about revenue opportunities. I know you raised lots of revenues in the sector already, but what might be the things there that could encourage a more sustainable sector? Um, where are the opportunities to create new products, new services, to collaborate with existing businesses in that space? And what about enterprise and, and an entrepreneurial mindset? So not just thinking about support for small businesses, of which the sector will have many, but also that mindset more generally about innovation, um, a degree of managed risk taking and being agile and, and, and responsive to um, circumstances. Um, so I guess in, in all of that, I thought, you know, one of the things um, um, reflected was just building those links locally um, to local businesses. Um, it was good to hear about the example of Giga earlier, that community wealth building been a key theme recently as well, been a great example of, of how those partnerships can be built locally, um, supporting local businesses um, and encouraging local communities too. So lots of challenges, lots of opportunities as well. Um, a great opportunity now to reset the strategy to think about key priorities um, and making sure in all of that um, that you're responsive and agile to what undoubtedly will be um, an, an uncertain 10 years ahead. Thank you. Thanks very much, Aidan. Well, lots to, lots to think about and consider later. So I hope some of you are, are formulating some questions to ask Aidan, um, but that certainly pulls out some of those tough economic challenges that stay with us as a sector as we emerge from COVID. Um, and the thought of trying to construct a flexible 10 year strategy that is able to, to handle that is quite something. So, um, so, so get your thinking hats on for, for questions. because so I think that will be, there'll be a lot of discussion around that economic sustainability now and moving into the longer term over the day ahead. So thank you very much. I'd now like to move on to our second speaker, Claire McGilvery, the founder and director for Making Rights Real. Claire is a community worker, an activist, a campaigner for human rights. Um, I don't quite know what, you know, <laughs> done a bit of, of so many rights related um, pieces of work. Um, absolutely fantastic. Claire is one of our unfairty individuals, courageous in discussing children's issues. Uh, a trustee of the Children's Parliament, um, an Atlantic Fellow for Economic and Social Equity with the London School of Economics. So a huge amount of, um, of knowledge to, to bring to us today. So I'll hand over to you, Claire, to, to give us your lightning talk. Great. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, our place and time is a golden opportunity to embed equality and human rights in our historic environment in Scotland. You might be thinking, what have human rights got to do with me? Um, so what words come to mind when you think of human rights? Turn to the person next to you. You've got 15 seconds to talk about the words that come up with you um, for about human rights. Go. Fifteen minutes up, or fifteen <laughs> seconds up. Hands up if you had words like justice or equality, law, freedom, protection. Um, all great words, but did you include words like racial equality, the right to a healthy environment, food banks, poverty, mould and poor housing, healthcare for trans men and women, 
prisoners' children seeing their parents, disabled people accessing public spaces, ethnic minority women facing domestic abuse, or the economic strategy for Scotland. Um, these are all human rights issues and experiences of people define whether human rights are upheld or not in Scotland. Eleanor Roosevelt, when she was launching the UN Declaration of Human, human Rights in 1948, said, where do human rights begin? In small places close to home, so close and so small that they can't be seen on any map of the world. Yet they are the world of the individual person, the neighbourhood they live in, the school or college they attend, the factory farm or office where they work, the historic environment building um, where they might visit. That shouldn't say that, but unless those, <laughs> unless those rights have meaning there, they have no meaning anywhere. So my question to you is whose place and whose time is being framed in your work and in this new strategy for Scotland? And how can this strategy use a human rights-based approach um, to transform Scotland? Our National Bard asks us to question ourselves. Oh, would some power the gift to gee us to see ourselves as others see us? It would frame on a blunder free us and foolish notion. So let's think about people place and power. Let's think about what people might say. Mary Brooks Bank, the Dundee weaver, poet and socialist, famously penned the Duke Mill song. Oh dear me, the world is ill divided. Them that work the hardest are I the least provided. So where can people living on low incomes go for free to see their stories across their, and access their heritage? What does their built environment say about inequality? What would gypsy travellers say about their historic um, places? Mm. Where are women's voices, children's voices heard or celebrated? How do people of colour, are they involved in designing spaces? So societal power structures are replicated in organisations and sectors, and this sector is no different. So the challenge we face is looking at our own positionality and power and asking searching questions that can lead to transformative action. Who controls the purse strings? Who controls the power in our organisations? How is racial capitalism, colonialism or wealth inequality factored into our work? And how can we transform the work that we do in a participative, rights-based way? There's a human rights truck of legislation coming to Scotland, in case you didn't know it. Um, there's a new act embedding children's rights into Scots law. That includes the right to play, the right to an adequate standard of living, including adequate housing, the right to education, and the right to take part in a wide range of cultural activities. And we have a new overarching human rights bill coming in this term of parliament as well. And that will bring four international treaties into Scots law and will include new rights to a healthy environment and for LGBTI people. So when these become law, in a couple of years' time, public bodies, like many of you who are sitting here today, will be directly accountable for people's human rights in Scotland's courts. So it's a really, really exciting time um, for Scotland. So I'll ask again, whose place and whose time is this strategy for? Participation from people from a wide range of communities is key. I'll leave you with the words of Rumi, who was a 13th century Sufi poet. Rumi demands, sell your cleverness and buy bewilderment. And the words of Rumi, forget safety, live where you fear to live, destroy your reputation, be notorious, be bold, creative and inclusive in your participation and listening to create our next place in time so that it becomes notorious for embedding communities' voices and human rights at its heart. Thank you, Claire. That was a very inspiring speech, uh, one that's throwing down the gauntlet to us today to come up with a strategy that does our duty by the human rights approaches that we should be embedding in our work moving forwards, being bold, 
destroying our reputations. It's going to be fun for the rest of today. <laughs> I look forward to that. But certainly lots to think about there. Um, and hopefully we'll see a really fresh new strategy coming out that is fit for purpose as a result of all of these discussions today. I'd now like to introduce our next speaker, Ben Twist. Um, ben has been Director of Carbon, Car Creative Carbon Scotland since 2011, so over 25 years of experience of directing and producing events and running permanent temporary venues in the cultural sector um, and bringing that carbon management and carbon, carbon living to, to our thinking today. Um, he's developed carbon cre Creative Carbon Scotland into a leader um, of the technical support for cultural organisations um, in carbon management, climate change adaptation, but also, really interestingly, de developing culture's role in moving towards decarbonising our society today. So really interesting perspectives to bring to our thinking. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Caroline, and thanks for having me today and uh, for listening. Um, this strategy should be built around climate change, by which I don't mean that it should have a section on pages 37 to 38 entitled climate change, but that addressing and responding to climate change should be threaded through it and at the heart of every page. I'm sure I don't need to explain why this should be so, but let me channel for a moment a sort of corporate Greta Thunberg and say that if humanity were on a trajectory to bankruptcy, the corporate plan would surely be first and foremost about avoiding that fate. We'd be using all the tools in the box to address that first and not leaving it to page 37. And as we all know, we're a long way down the line on that trajectory to environmental bankruptcy. And of course, this is a government strategy and addressing and responding to climate change is one of the Scottish government's four priorities in the recent spending review. So this strategy should surely have climate change at its heart. But there's another perhaps more emotional reason why this strategy should focus with great intensity on climate change. The very historic buildings, land and cityscapes that make up the historic environment are directly threatened by climate change. We all know about the Skara Brays and the Western Isles and sea level rise, but there are also all the other buildings, sites and items at risk from damp, drought, heat, erosion, severe weather events and goodness knows what other impacts which are unequivocally caused by climate change. Jack Ridge, the Director of Conservation at the National Galleries, once told me that her job description effectively says that she is responsible for conserving their works of art for perpetuity. There goes your early retirement, Jack. Um, well, climate change is directly targeted at those works and the buildings that they are kept in. Failing to reduce emissions today and not investing in the adaptation required will mean that in 20, 30, 100 years time, it will either be too late or it will cost so much that beautiful things will have to be let go. Climate change is baked into Jack's role, and that probably goes for many of you. What then can this historic environment strategy and those in charge of it do? We're at the beginning of possibly the most extensive period of planned change in human history. Managing change is a frequently used concept in the historic environment field, but from my point of view in another corner of the cultural world, I know that we need to manage outwards as well as inwards. We can't simply manage the changes to those things and operations for which, which we are directly responsible. Cultural sites, buildings, and organizations are highly visible, and we can and must take both the responsibility and the opportunities that this implies. We influence the public and other groups. We can change by doing. Now, managing change isn't new, and historic sites and buildings in Scotland have enormous audiences and enormous influence. They can teach us all about how change happened in the past and explain how it was responded to successfully or otherwise and provide examples of well-managed change today. They provide opportunities for experimentation and leadership. Demonstrating positive change on a high-profile building or cityscape could give officials, leaders and communities the courage to champion their own changes which may be politically or locally difficult. And a strategy that encourages this, acknowledging that in this challenging process, not everyone will get everything right, is important. It will provide legitimacy for justifiable risk-taking and for difficult budgetary decisions. And I myself am going to exhibit risky behavior by saying this in today's company. A strong and thought-through strategy will provide leaders with the frameworks, the justification, and the courage to decide to let much-loved things go. We all know that this is going to have to happen sooner or later. 
Better to do it rationally and strategically than piecemeal and randomly as the worst climate change impacts hit. We also all know that those impacts will hit the less favored, more marginalized places and communities and their own historic environments soonest and hardest. Lack of a strategy will make those unplanned, unmanaged changes even less fair. Climate change is one of the human rights issues that Claire identified. So I said at the as I said at the beginning, this strategy should be built around climate change and not just on page 37. It should take a realistic approach to what climate change will do to our historic sites and buildings. It should provide the leadership to take difficult decisions. It should look inwards and manage those changes that are coming. It sh should help us learn from the past to plan for the future. And it should look optimistically at the historic environment's ability to help us all to manage the external changes that society is facing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ben. Um, again, a lot to think about here. And I'm particularly struck by the um, interconnectedness of the work that we're doing now, the fact that we're, we'll be having our new Scotland biodiversity strategy coming out later in this year, and how we get all of these strategies to really interrelate and work hard um, on the climate change agenda, because of course the biodiversity crisis is the other side of that that we also need to consider, and the historic environment has a huge part to play in that too. So um, I expect there'll be many questions and discussions around this um, later on today. Thank you. Um, if I can now move on to introduce our next uh, lightning talk speaker, Lawrence Durden um, from Skills Development Scotland. S Lawrence um, is a member of the Tourism Sk Skills Group in Scotland and a representative on the Scottish Tourism Emergency Response Group, working to help the sector recover from the impacts of the pandemic. So I'm sure lots of interesting insights there. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, and thank you for inviting me along today. Um, Five minutes isn't long, so I'll push on. Um, what are the key drivers of the skills agenda going forward that we know about? Um, five big ones, demographic change. Um, we're seeing a shrinking work age population. We're seeing rising dependency ratios, the number of uh, the ratio between those working and those needing support, help um, and care. Um, and this is having a massive impact and is gonna to continue to have a massive impact so we need to maximize all the talent and skills available in Scotland. Brexit's already been mentioned. Uh, Brexit's having a massive impact, slowing population growth. EU nationals who left during the pandemic uh, are not returning. Um, and this, as we've heard, is already an impediment to economic recovery and creating labor shortages, about which I'm sure you're all very aware. Um, so we need to engage with and attract the working age population Industry 4.0, um, you've probably, I'm sure you've all heard of that, the fourth industrial revolution. It is causing and is going to cause one of the biggest changes in the workplace we've ever seen. Um, constant disruption at fast pace, technological disruption, globalization, aging population, um, and increasing diversity in the workplace, um, which is just leading to massive change very fast. So workers need to retrain and businesses need to look at new business models to cope with this. So we need programs of upskilling and reskilling, and we really need to revolutionize in-work skills and learning. We need agile, short, sharp courses with meta skills, um, a fairly new phrase, again, you may have heard, at the heart of all the learning that we do. Meta skills are the key skills that we need in the economy going forward, so self-management, social intelligence, and innovation. And linked to that, the nature of work is changing. There are new work patterns. Hybrid working models is now a common term, which again, I'm sure you're all familiar with. And remote and digital locations are becoming increasingly normal. So we need increased digital literacy. Um, and we, are, uh, we have already a, a, um, a digital uh, skills action plan, DSAP. And we need constant learning and relearning and new models for upskilling. Net zero and carbon, um, as we've heard, massive agenda. There are new green jobs, retrofit heating, retrofit housing. We need smart grid infrastructure, renewables, growth, um, and a transport revolution. So all of these 
um, mean we need to invest in new skills that are aligned both to digital, but also to net zero carbon. And we also have a CSAP, a careers, uh, a carbon emergency skills action plan. What are the top five challenges? The scale of upskilling and reskilling, the challenge of transition to net zero is immense and it requires um, a concerted effort by employers, government and skills providers. Um, we need to look at how to empower Scottish workers to commit to personal upskilling and reskilling. Labour shortages are likely to be a persistent feature of the labour market for the next three to five years at least. The labour market continues to tighten. The employment rate has risen and 16 plus unemployment remains low, only 3.2%. A rise in economic inactivity over the past two years as well, so more people taking themselves out of the labour market for health reasons, care reasons and, and other reasons. Um, all companies and sectors are competing for a shrinking pool of labour is the reality. So employers will need talent attraction and retention strategies to meet their talent requirements and an increase on fair work practices. They also need to look at accessibility and equality and inclusion practices in the workplace. The NSET that's already been talked about aims to address these and many other challenges. My, my field is tourism. A recent um, Scottish Tourism Alliance survey demonstrated the challenges the industry are facing, which you'll all be aware of. Increased demand for travel has highlighted labour shortages in the sector. Businesses report the three challenges they face, rising energy costs, increasing supplier costs, recruitment and staffing. The main barriers to recruitment reported are lack of available staff wanting to work or able to work, UK immigration policy, Brexit, and a negative perception of the sector. And I know the Historic Environments um, SIP, Skills Investment Plan, is already addressing a lot of these and great work is going on. The barriers to retaining staff, seasonality, other sectors are more attractive, and inability to pay competitively. Um, and all of these are increasing the mental health and wellbeing challenges of people working within the sector. There are a lot of, um, there is support available, and I'll finish with four quick questions. How can we encourage staff to commit to upskill and reskill? How can we better attract talent into careers and jobs in the historic environment sector and cultural sector? How can we do more to promote fair work practices across the sector? And how can we develop and support a more diverse workforce? Thank you very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Again, a lot to think about there and the complexity and the immediacy of those challenges are, are really apparent. I can think of projects that we work with at the fund across the country who are really struggling right now with staff shortages and not able to open. So, you know, it, it chimes, um, chimes with me in terms of a national impact that that's having. And it also resonates with, with what you were saying, Aidan, and again, with what the minister was saying about the priority for skills. So, Getting that right and being able to adapt to the needs of um, the changing needs is going to be a real challenge for us in this strategy, but something that's critical that we do address and and work through. So um, thank you. That was um, not not say uplifting, but very thought provoking, Lawrence. Thank you. Thank you for that. If I can now move on to our final speaker, Elsa McFarlane, Director of the Built Environment Forum for Scotland. And as many of you will know, Elsa's got a very wide ranging experience in partnership working, stakeholder collaboration across the historic environment sector um, and distills that complexity, much of which we've just heard of today, um, across the various policy landscapes into, into um, accessible information for, for us in the sector and beyond to you. So Elsa, I'm very much looking forward to hearing what you have to say today. Thank you, Caroline. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak today and also for the other speakers because I've really appreciated hearing their perspective as well as the support from the Minister in his address today. Um, BEFS works across the existing built and historic environment. We represent a wide range of members, professionals, civic and funders. Um, on this occasion, I'm perhaps giving a more personal reflection on the future of OPIT. So much has changed and we've, we've heard already this morning since, since our place in time was formed Social movements have brought perspectives to the fore. COVID has changed our understanding of interactions. Thinking around climate has coalesced into national and supranational asks and terms. 
the economy and how and where we spend money has changed from online expansion to cost of living crises and COVID restrictions. And with COVID, there were obviously many painful lessons, but there were also learnings that we can take forward as a sector. I think we can move faster than we ever thought. And sometimes with this, we tried, we failed, we adapted, but we also accepted those challenges and we learned how to share the learning. And with that, we also learned that sometimes the imperfect can still drive change and action and positive outcomes. And perhaps most importantly, in an arena where competition doesn't naturally breed collaboration, we learned that the collective voice is genuinely stronger for garnering support for the sector. Within this changing world, the historic environment remains not always necessarily steadfast nor stalwart, but absolutely delivering solutions, potential, the, the backdrop of our lives, be it homes, workplaces, economic centres, or where we spend time for leisure or learning. And how did OPIT change us? We've heard about some of the fantastic successes earlier, but perhaps I'm more interested in the process and what the processes can be going forward. Today and in the coming months, I'd like us all to perhaps find a small selection, hard fought and undoubtedly with nuance, of strategic aims, aims that can't be achieved without a national strategy. I think we can make the strategy do more and be more than shining a light on the good works and marking a report card for activity already ongoing. I think, I think OPIT can be used to make step changes, to challenge thinking, to approach some of the thorny issues that we've heard about this morning, be that data and knowledge management, prioritization, skills challenges, genuine inclusivity and access, as well as delivering on net zero aims. The ability and knowledge is often already here. The collaboration and transparency of action and intent need to be harnessed. Partnership grows ever more necessary as budgets are squeezed. Let's attempt to make the outcomes about partnership thinking and not just with the usual faces, but with those to whom we can provide solutions. Solutions to their estates, their workforces, to wider well-being and net zero goals. Let's set our intent on ways of working, modes of operating, processes we know will support positive outcomes, even at times without knowing where those outcomes might definitively lie. Our strengths remain in our organizations, our individual work plans, our deep knowledge bases. Let's form a cohesive strategy that supports collaboration, innovation, and transparency. We're a sector where knowing your crittle from your crenellation matters, and rightly so, but we need to express our worth beyond those details. Because of those details, yes, but beyond that understanding. I'm going to suggest that to many, the heritage doesn't matter. Depending on your audience, the carbon matters, the tourism matters, the community matters, the employment matters, the skills matter, the places and the people, they matter. What the sector already does so well must now be clearly expressed as about the benefits, not just about the stuff. We build schools, hospitals, and new housing because we're seeking outcomes, not accumulating artifacts. We need a strategy that enables us to appeal to those looking for outcomes, encourages us to explain the value of the incredible resources we get to work with. These sites that we protect and conserve most often weren't built as static artifacts. They were homes, palaces, barns, places of worship, and civic sites of all kinds. Their use was their purpose. Purposes change. We've been accepting and dealing with that for as long as there's been heritage in the historic environment. Now we need a sector strategy led by new challenges and focused on relatable outcomes. Articulating the benefits we bring to those outcomes will enable us to maintain and protect the irreplaceable resource that we work with now and for the future, ensuring that our sector can have the sustainable future it so richly deserves. Thank you, Elsa. Lots of wisdom there for us to think about today. Um, I'm really struck by the need to have a learning approach to our strategy, recognising when mistakes have happened and being able to talk about them collaboratively across the sector and learn from them in a positive way. I think the amount of change we've just heard articulated means we, we won't be getting everything right in anything we try to plan at this point, particularly something with the, the longevity of this particular strategy. So we need to be transparent and open 
and able to have those discussions about where we could have done better and how to make those changes as we recognize that so that we're not sitting and waiting for the next strategy. We're re recognizing making the changes. I think being bold and brave, as Claire would say. So thank you very much to all of our speakers. And I'd now like to open the floor up to anyone with questions. Um, and also, I, I will be keeping an eye out. Oh, in fact, there are questions coming up which are not on my screen. Um, to um, to the panel, so I will just have to turn yeah. turn away to look at those. Yeah. And apologies, I will just read them out as well, just for increased accessibility for those of you who can't can't see those clearly. So the first question, which I will take to Claire, because it's in large font, and I can read that at this point. Um, <laughs> Claire, the UN Global Goals. How do we actualise these and get beyond the rhetoric? I presume you're talking about the Sustainable Development Goals um, when you're saying the UN Global Goals. And I think, for me, the Sustainable Development Goals need to be linked more um, be better in Scotland to the National Performance Framework as well and linked to the Human Rights Indicators, which will be developed through the um, National Performance Framework. To not get too geeky about that, I won't because I could be here all day. Um, actually, it's about people naming and claiming their rights for change. That's where we'll see change actually happening, is the people who are the most marginalised and who need the change most um, can grasp the issues and be able to name and claim their rights to make change happen. Change won't happen um, by people in power holding on to that power. Change will only happen um, when there's real movement and transformation and trying to um, realise rights in a practical way in people's lives, where they live, where they work um, uh, and others. So for me, it's really about people um, being active to name and claim their rights across all sectors and being able to um, show where that progressive realisation of rights is happening. Can I add something? Absolutely. Um, the last goal, the 17th goal, is about partnership working. And I think what we've just heard today already demonstrates how closely all these things are interlinked. And um, partnership working is going to be absolutely essential, it seems to me, uh, to, uh, to address these issues so that we're not addressing them in silos, uh, a government level, uh, below that, and between sectors, uh, between organisations in sectors. Partnership working is where it's all going to make sense, I think, and only when we get these things right, and I'm talking to Claire and, and Ailsa and so on, uh, will we, will we make, make these things happen. I think it's absolutely essential that last goal is, is highlighted. Thank you, Ben. And a question for Aidan. Um, could you give us your thoughts on how the new Our Place and Time strategy can help us focus on community wealth building and community well-being, maximising the quality of life and the economic benefits? Um, yeah, I can certainly give that a go. Uh, <laughs> um, actually, I've noticed that the shorter questions get bigger font, isn't it? It's quite interesting. Oh, yes, I so, really. <laughs> so, so, so it's quite an incentive to keep questions quite short there. Uh, <laughs> So community wealth building is a, it, it's a key part of the strategy. Um, it's, there's obviously a, a bill going through um, in, 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 in terms of um, you know, parliament around, around all of that. Um, so I suppose it, it kind of links a bit into what we were saying earlier, isn't it, about making best use of you know, the assets we have and drawing in um, the contributions um, as best we can you know, within, within different communities. Um, so I think that, that that's inevitably going to be, you know, critical of, of partnership working involving local communities, involving local authorities in all of that, um, really identifying what those assets are and that, that support locally is going to be important. Um, I suppose there's also just inevitability around just how do you, how do you engage and empower those communities to be able to properly, it's interesting, it's linked to the sort of rights agenda, but, but, but for enable people to actually properly engage um, and there'll be inequalities in all of that because you know different people have an abil different abilities to engage and also have different resources that they can bring so it's it's a really um it's a, it's a, it's it's a, it's, a, it's an exciting new agenda There's some great examples of that some of those were mentioned earlier um i think something to think about for me is in in a context of um challenging resources more generally what what could the community wealth bringing bring um as well so and and what support would it need um locally um, to make that happen, to bring the best out of it all and to make sure that it's done 
in a way that supports um, a fairer society, um, uh, you know, as, as, as well. So um, I don't have the practical examples there, but um, just some, some initial thoughts from me. Thanks, Aidan. I wonder if you've got anything you'd like to add to that. Uh, yeah, for me, it's also about the structural inequalities in society which are there and power and how power holds on to power um, and how people can actually influence community wellbeing. Because I hear a lot of communities across Scotland saying that actually when they raise their voices, they're not heard. They're not heard by public authorities or they're actively ignored or people are hard to reach instead of actually being easy to ignore. So for me, there's a real difficulty there for people in terms of how they're able to participate in community wealth being when there are those structural inequalities which already um, don't enable them to participate. And how do we take a kind of an intersectional approach then to make sure that people of, of different abilities, of different um, backgrounds, are able to be involved in community wealth being means that we need to level the playing field a bit. For me, there's a lot of good stuff happening around um, human rights budgeting in Scotland, which could be advanced a bit more as well in terms of, okay, what's the national picture of, of budgets? How can communities be engaged and involved in holding um, you to account and others to account around budgets? And also about participatory budgeting. How can we engage um, community wealth building in a rights-based approach to participate? participatory budget and when we know that one percent of local authorities should be um spent in a participative way so there's lots of opportunities there loads of challenges but for me it's also about recognizing power and the structural inequalities which prevent people from being able to be engaged in many times thank thank you claire um, I've now got a question, Lawrence. Um, in light of the skills shortages that you've you've been articulating, um, can you tell us about how the schools and colleges, college curriculums, are adapting to meet these skills gaps? Um, that's a big question. Yes, um, I mean there's a huge amount of work going on uh, within the curriculum in school, particularly around I mentioned meta skills. I yeah. think um, colleges and universities as well doing a, a power of work um, to engage with industry to really understand what the, the needs are that, um, that industry needs. I know there are college and university people uh, here today who, who will reinforce that increased dialogue between businesses and schools. We've also seen um, initiatives like developing young workforce. So developing young workforce um, across the country is all about bringing together education, schools, um, and businesses um, to, in a dialogue, but also with businesses supporting young people in school um, and vice versa, schools um, engaging with businesses to understand and address the needs. We've seen things like Foundation Apprenticeships being developed. There's now a Hospitality Foundation Apprenticeship, which is where the apprenticeship journey starts in school. So they don't leave school now doing an apprenticeship, they started in school and they start to work with employers around exciting projects and innovative projects. Um, meta skills, um, it's a bit of a buzz phrase. We used to call them core skills, I guess, and other things. They're now being built into increasingly into the programs that SDS has. So um, apprenticeships, modern apprenticeships, graduate apprenticeships, meta skills, these, these key skills are being put into the heart of these programs. So I mentioned the headline self-management, social intelligence, innovation. You can break that down uh, into subgroups such as emotional intelligence, um, feeling, collaboration. These are the skills that are needed going forward. So what's happening is um, it's, it's slow. I, I talked about a revolution, but there's an increasing realization that the skills that are needed for the future are perhaps different to those in the past. We tended to focus on technical skills. It's much more now about meta skills. And so for us in the heritage sector, with our traditional focus on building traditional building skills, et cetera, that's something that we'll need to take on board in our strategy. Yeah, it's both. But I think it, it's, it's recognizing in terms of the strategy, how do you build in those meta skills to all the training that you do? It's almost a layered approach. So at the heart, you have the meta skills and then you start having the more technical and job-specific skills higher up. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, now, more of a process question, so I'm going to direct this to Elsa. Um, Elsa, could you tell us what the fixed points are in time around which we can develop these outcomes for, for the strategy? 
so <laughs> exam question. <laughs> the, the fixed points in, in time around which we can develop the strategy, as in how quickly we need to well, adapt and, and, and change these, these processes. Um, what I would imagine is that there are, there are other strategies under development. Um, how, how are we going to integrate this? I think um, Nick, 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 did you ask this question? So perhaps you could um, elaborate a little bit more on that. Thank you. Uh, y yes, happy to elaborate. Um, sorry, it's a rather odd question. It's OK. It's is... also, I, couldn't, I couldn't see it on the screen, and that was the other thing. That was... Where's this come from? There, there's a background to it. Um, so looking at a, at a very uh, closely aligned sector to this uh, in biodiversity, where biodiversity we know is in a bad shape, it's decreasing. So ministers have said to us, we want you to specifically have a strategy that halts the loss of biodiversity by 2030 and restores nature by 2045. And those obviously link very closely to the climate change timescale. So we know that by 2030, the natural environment needs to be in such a condition and we can then say, well, if it needs to be like this, then these are the outcomes. And working back, here are the things that we need to do collectively and the pace at which we need to do it. So a bit like climate change, we can then say, are we on track or not? So I was wondering, are there specific points in the future where you need, and this is a really big question, the historic environment or bits of it to be in a certain condition? And there may be actually very strongly linked to the climate change, but there might be other bits. Absolutely. Thank, thank you very much for, for clarifying. I would say that when we're talking about the, the timeline, our existing environment, which obviously is a great deal of our historic environment, um, the heat and building strategy and how we maintain all of our homes and enable our homes to be appropriate, appropriately retrofitted and ready for that, which again obviously ties into the skills the skills crisis that, that we see, particularly around traditional skills. So I think that is probably one of the major areas around which we will have to coalesce. Because if, if we don't ensure that people understand the care of our, the care of all of our existing environment, and particularly, particularly within homes, I mean, we, to, to sort of echo one of uh, Ben's points earlier, we, we cannot build our way out of a climate crisis. It's very important that looking after what we have for its cultural value, for its value as a home, is absolutely essential. And I think the, the skills crisis that we have in that area, as well as, I mean, there are issues around materials, there are issues around all sorts of things that, that interlink. So again, it is, it is a big question, but I think absolutely that's probably the 2030 and the 2045 sort of EPC heat and energy targets are ones which will be, I think, I think drivers within this. Can I, can I add something again? Yes, absolutely, Ben. Um, we just recently worked with Creative Scotland to write their climate emergency and sustainability plan. And working with carbon people and adaptation people on that, one of the key things that we put forward and that they've accepted is that um, there needs to be foundation work done now so that we're not in the same place in five years' time um, and we're, we're, at, we're at the beginning again. So we may not know the solutions, we may not know the, uh, the outcomes, we know, may not know where, even where we need to get to, but we need to do that research, that building work now, so that we're ready to take the next steps. And, and actually possibly a different group of people are ready to take the next board of Creative Scotland, um, which will be quite different in five, six years' time, um, is, has, has been given that uh, advanced work now so that uh, they can move forward more effectively. And I, I do think one of the things to say is we, we do need to start taking transformational steps, giant steps, seven league boots are what we need rather than the baby steps. So, um, and that is going to require, I think, a lot of this research, this foundational work, so that then we can really leap forward. Because otherwise, we're going to be constantly making small steps in five years' time, in 10 years' time, and so on. So I think there's, there's a lot of work like that to do. Thank you. Would any of the other panelists like to comment on that? question there's a lot in there yep they all shout at once <laughs> thank you um so an interesting one here um we've talked about inclusion the need to be collaborative working with communities um a question asking you know inclusivity can often involve negotiating different values leading to conflicts that need to be sensitively managed and it can be constrained by oh my question has just vanished i think to jump to the end of the question <laughs> How can we manage, how can we use our strategy and our approach to support that community empowerment that we've heard about today from Claire and others and make sure that those voices are heard, um, but that the conversations happen in a way that is, um, is beneficial as far as it can be or positive for, for all involved. Not so it won't be challenging, 
but um, any thoughts on the management of those conversations that will inevitably be part of developing this next strategy and implementing it? Claire. I think for me, using a human rights based approach provides an overall um, way to be able to enable people to come together. And because the key part of that is around participation mm -hmm. and participation um, on people's own terms rather than on the terms of the organisation which is trying to consult because often that means that people have already or the organisation already has an idea what it wants to do and it's not actually um, a clear space for people to be able to engage. Um, so for me the participation element of a rights-based approach is, is really important being where people are at. Um, the accountability aspect is also important. What is up for change? And don't um, say to people that or to communities that you you can change this when actually you can't. Don't you know? Don't make false promises and be open to that accountability and not just accountability on your terms, but on the accountability of what the people who need change most want to change. So that accountability mechanism is really important. Um, the non-discrimination part of a rights-based approach is who's furthest from the table, who's not round your table and why are they not round your table. So where are gypsy travellers in this conversation? Where are um, trans men and women in this conversation? Where are children in this conversation? And there's really great participative methods that have been used by Children's Parliament and others um, to engage in a really profound way um, with people. Um, the empowerment aspect of a rights-based approach is, okay, tell and support people with their learning around how they can make change happen. And the last aspect of a rights-based approach is the L for legality, which is what's actually going to change in your processes, systems, the law, which will you will be able to be accountable for. So for me, um, it is about taking a rights-based approach in the broadest sense um, and enabling as many people as forward to come forward and have that dialogue. Thanks, Claire. Did any, oh, Elsa, were you? Um, and I think, obviously, um, supporting that, but I think there's definitely something about transparency and open decision-making. The word prioritisation has obviously been mentioned a few times today already, but just ensuring that if you are making decisions of any kind, particularly where there are many different values, sort of having a systematic approach, having a clear approach, and having an approach that's fair regardless of where that decision is, is being made, so people understand the process, even if obviously there are nuances and difficulties in the discussion. There's also something around the, um, the capabilities approach to fairness and justice, I think. And um, one of the things that I think culture, and perhaps again, my area of culture, the performing arts and so on, um, more obviously than the historic environment, but I'm sure it's true in, in your area too. Um, culture has been shown over the years, I think, to, um, to increase uh, cultural activity and participation has been shown to really develop um, and increase social capital, both on a, in an individual and a community basis. And so I think if people, and this is something very important to climate change, but I think it's equally important here. If people are going to be uh, invited to the table, they also need to be uh, able to participate. Um, they need to have the language, they have to have the confidence. Um, and we, we need to ensure that uh, those, that, that social capital, if you like, that I think can enable, can uh, facilitate that um, is something that we're also focusing on. So I think it's this, we can't just make ourselves open to, to voices and expect everybody to uh, to be able to part, to communicate fully, to be able to participate fully. Uh, we need to make sure that they they've got those those capabilities uh, to do so. And I think our world can help in that as well. Thank you. So that sounds like a call to arms to make sure that our next strategy um, is one that we can really engage people with and that we, we go out to meet them rather than expecting the outside world to come and meet our sector on our terms. And I think thinking about how we do that structurally um, as well as through the outcomes that we're going to lay out is something that is incumbent upon us. So um, really good question and lots of, lots of um, interesting content in those answers. Um, thank you. Um, and I think the next question is therefore very pertinent. Um, Measuring the intangible, how far can the strategy support and inform primary research into understanding the way we can demonstrate and describe the impact of our actions? Obviously, our aspirations, however bold we want to be, if we can't measure and describe and evidence the impact, will be significantly weakened. So how will we, how will we manage that? Is that an answer to the question coming in? You posted the question. 
Would you like to add that in then? So yes, absolutely, from my perspective. Sorry, I'm slightly shaking over here. This is such an important point in my view. Um, but is it, is it the culture sector itself that keeps worrying about us needing to prove to ourselves that it's important? Or you know, do we need to be braver and just step outside that, or heritage sector or whatever, and uh, say, actually, it's accepted, therefore the conversation moves on into a whole new realm. We're being a bit braver about our impact. I don't know, there's, but anyway. David, that was exactly the right question you asked, and let's pass it back to the panel. Excellent question, thank you. Um, one that's really, you know, really interesting thing to throw open at this point, when we're just beginning the conversation about how we shape up our strategy for, the, for our place in time. Something, you know, this is the moment to be asking the, these questions. Um, I'm tempted to jump in and begin answering myself, and I'm not on the panel, so I'll restrain myself no, and hand over to Elsa initially. And then I wonder, Aidan, if you might also have something you'd like to add on to this, just from your, your background as well. So, but a Elsa, if you'd like to start. I mean, I, I understand that obviously demonstrating the, the cultural value of, of what we do and proving what's important is something that the sector has done for a very long time. And I think perhaps there is a baseline and a good understanding for that. So I think being able to take that, that step change, and I would, I would say there is always more data that is needed, but there is also a time to say what's, what's good enough and where we can demonstrate, demonstrate those, those changes that we've made. I think there is a great deal of data that's needed about our existing environment. I think we need to know about age, we need to know about condition, we need to know what's necessary to be able to model for the future. But that is also one part of the historic environment. So I don't want to necessarily sort of go too, too far down, down that line. But I would I very much agree with the gist of the question that actually it is about being bolder. And quite frankly, I think we should be using the word unfairty as much as possible for the next five years. But um, I, might, I might leave that there and let, let other people step in. Nathan? Yeah, I suppose a, a couple of thoughts. I completely agree about that kind of proportionality point. Um, that said, I think, I, th I think there is, it is always worth trying to quantify what you can. Um, and I was quite struck by sort of some of the KPIs you had in your previous strategy. And, and there's just that sense of demonstrable progress and accountability that comes from that. Um, so do what you can, but know the limits. Just a little anecdote. I remember my first job I had as Department of Transport. Um, I had to do, I was involved in a study that was trying to work out the value of views of Stonehenge. Um, and it involved asking motorists um, the value of Stonehenge for them as they went past every day, you know, how much of a, how much, how much they put on that? Um, because they're thinking about different options for tunnels, um, or around Stonehenge and all of that. And it came out perversely that actually, because motorists liked seeing Stonehenge and more of them went past Stonehenge, if it was a shorter tunnel, then actually it meant that the kind of consequence of this was that, um, we don't have a tunnel and um, that you kind of effectively drive through or around Stonehenge. So I only gave that little example because it shows the extremes of where, you know, um, you, you could end up sometimes if you try and over, over hard to try and put an economic value on something, you could end up with really quite perverse things. And I think there's a degree of common sense in some of this um, that's important, but nonetheless, keeping indicators in, in mind is really important too. I just want to ask, um, how do you know you're measuring what matters? Um, and who defines what matters and who does it matter to and why does it matter and how can you build in people's stories and I mean people in terms of the wider communities but you yourselves in this sector um, how can those stories impact um, your sector and what needs to change so I'm just throwing the question back to you you can have that in your working group so that's my <laughs> gift to you <laughs> Thank you, Claire. Would any of the other panellists like to comment on that? Uh, just um, anybody who knows me knows that um, I like to talk about complex social systems. And um, uh, I think we're talking about very complex questions here. And um, I, I worry slightly about putting, things, putting economic value on these things rather than uh, all the other values that you're just touching upon, Claire. And, and actually, I think we, one of the, that's what we need to, need to do is get better at understanding complex systems and how all these things fit together and how difficult it is to measure uh, the impacts of what we uh, do to a complex system and how we change that. We need to know more about that, I think, um, but it's, it's quite challenging and it's, it certainly isn't, in my view, putting um, economic value on things and, and that's it, that we need to have a much better system of thinking about these things. Um 
just going to say that we also tend to measure what we're asked to measure. So there's definitely an element where what we're asked to measure by funders, be it, um, be it the, the NPF, be it sustainable development goals, these are things that we tend to be asked to measure often by government and then perhaps by, by other funders. So sometimes it's also about the questions that we're asked, not just the questions that we then ask in turn. So if, if there are major challenges there, perhaps there are bigger questions to be asked about what we're being asked to prove by, by funders. I would just say around skills, there, there are a huge range of performance indicators and measures, um, reports produced. Um, I, I, uh, just picking up on the points made, we, we recently funded a lot of training for the tourism sector, management leadership, disability inclusion, low carbon and so on. Um, and all the measures were, were about numbers and um, you know, how many people have gone through it. The really valuable stuff we're getting back is the difference it's made to people in terms of how they do their job, um, how they feel about doing their job, their mental health and well-being. So it's, it's it, you know, the numerical stuff's fine, but it's capturing actually the difference that it's made that we found really powerful. Thank you, panel, and really interesting questions there. Um, really, what are we measuring? What, are we what story are we trying to tell through what we're measuring? Something for us to look hard at. It sounds to me as if it's those stories that we need to bring out about people, the impacts we're having, that the measurements we made, you know, the measurement approach we've got for the built environment itself, um, you know, what, what more do we need to do to gather that understanding? How do we balance that with articulating the impacts that we're having, where we, where, we, where we need to move? And we've really heard a story of change and challenge from this panel. And how are we going to be able to measure that change rather than what we have been measuring under the previous OPIT? But I think to go back to that transparency of process, uh, which Elsa touched on, if we're going to have transparency, we will need to be able to art articulate that change in some way. So this is a real, really interesting challenge for us to, to bring a common sense and balanced approach to what we're, what we are measuring and really ask ourselves, why, so what, when we're looking at it? So, um, yeah, this, <laughs> we're really coming back with more questions than answering them at this, at this point. Um, right. Let's have a look. I think we've got time for a couple more. More questions. Is Richard Oram here uh, in the room, or is that an online question? Richard over there. I think Richard, you asked a question for Ben about climate change centrality, and I wondered if you could perhaps ask that and expand upon it a little with some context. Yeah, the question was I absolutely agree with you on centrality, climate change in all of this background. I'm professor of environmental history and one of the biggest problems that I see within this sector is that we still have this um, tendency to divide everything into that great duality between nature and culture uh, and one of the things that we are needing to do is understand you're talking about complex systems Scotland is an historic environment and a living environment why do we continue to talk about a historic environment narrowly when we really need to get our heads around the fact if we're going to get children to understand and appreciate and value and change the way we're, we're too old get the children in how are we going to get them to understand the interconnectedness of all i'm not sure that's really a question for me i have to say it may have started out with climate change but it seemed to become about everything else um it's uh maybe well, climate change is the answer isn't it to everything else uh, well it's certainly it's certainly one of the challenges to everything um i'm i'm not, I'm not sure i have an answer but I'll, I'll go back to a couple of things i've said already um one is that um we uh we do i would say yes we do need to um stop this false nature culture dichotomy um uh i i would say that this um that partnership working that i spoke about earlier may be a a potential solution to this. Um, in the, the work we did for Creative Scotland, we were recommending very strongly that Creative Scotland needs to work with pu other public bodies, Historic in Sco Environment Scotland, um, but also local authorities, uh, SEPA and what have you. I'm sure the same is true in, in your bit of the sector. Um, uh, we, these, these, these questions are not going to be solved by one little corner solving them. Um, they're going to be uh, solved by, by joint working. And perhaps I can just throw in a, a, a favorite thing of mine. One of the great things I think about um, historic sites, historic buildings, 
um, the public ones, um, where, where they're um, not, the, not the flats that many people live in, but the, the public ones, is that they, um, I think they help society to think. They bring people together at the same time, quite often, um, to, to think about the same things in the same place. So there's a collective thinking that goes on. And I think this is a really important part of it. When, um, maybe not when you drive past Stonehenge, but when you go to Stonehenge or you go to the Ring of Brogga or wherever it may be, um, you, um, you, you go there and the people that you're there with are all doing the same thing at the same time. They're setting aside time and they're setting aside space in their mind to think about the same thing. I think that's a really valuable thing that cultural sites, cultural buildings and what have you, uh, and events indeed, can do. And I think it's on those occasions when you get that collective thinking that actually, and I am coming back to your question, that helps join up these different parts, these different parts of our brains, the different questions, the landscapes, the, the, the what formed the landscape and so on. And the people who hold those sites, curate those sites, are able to guide the thinking and support that thinking, facilitate that communal and collective thinking that I think was the only way that we're going to solve these problems, these big challenges that we've got. That's a long answer to a question which might not have answered it at all, but that's what I offer you, so. Richard, I hope that has answered your question to, to, to some degree. I'm sure we can catch up over coffee for more. <laughs> um, I think one final question, which I'll direct to, to Aidan, um, is what hope of a more supportive UK fiscal policy, that removed from <laughs> repair and retrofit, which I think I see cropping up in other, in other questions too. It's a, it's a big one, you know, and, and we've been talking about big change today. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, so, I, so it's interesting. I, when I first joined Scottish Government, um, I was covered housing, and I seem to recall letters that were sent to um, UK ministers then raising this very issue in the context of, you know, supporting better housing stock and, and standards. So, so this has been going on for quite some time. Um, so in terms of hope, um, I guess, I guess that's, that's some, somewhat um, affected by the fact that it's been a long time asking. Um, I don't know whether this is one of those things that, you know, EU exit, you know, um, flexibilities around VAT mean there might potentially be more room for maneuver than there was in the past. I don't know that question. Um, the answer to that question, but um, I guess anything that involves spending lots of money at the moment or you know giving tax breaks is going to be challenging given the overall fiscal situation. But again, given the imperative and some of the issues we've talked about in terms of climate change, net zero, moving to maintenance, moving to retrofit, reducing carbon footprint, I guess the arguments for making that move um, are, grow stronger over time. So I'm afraid I can't second guess the Chancellor. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Sorry for that, that killer final question <laughs> from, the, from the floor. Um, I just, would anyone else, Elsa, others want to just comment on that briefly? Well, we know that VAT removal on retrofit low carbon heating systems and technologies has already been suggested by Westminster, but I think, and I'm forever hopeful, um, that this perhaps leaves a very small crack in an open door to perhaps suggest that obviously the further related adaptations and maintenance before those technologies are put in um, could also therefore receive similar, um, a similar VAT approach. But it, obviously that is a, a, very, a very small crack in, in the open door, but that was definitely a, a, more, a more recent suggestion from Westminster. It's linked also though to tax justice. I noticed that there are a few questions there around that, and we're not really talking about the size of the tax pie. And what do we need to do in relation to that if we actually want to make a society where housing and other um, um, issues which um, are, are big in people's lives can actually be retrofitted to, to suit so that they've not got sewage coming up through their sinks or mould around their properties, which is some of the people that I see and that I'm working with in the housing um, field. So we need to also have that discussion about um, tax justice and the tax system across all of our systems in the way that we're um, talking in our work. Thank you. Um, Controversial one. No. <laughs> always, always good to Drop end the a debate on tax. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I'm very aware we're now standing between <laughs> the audience and coffee. So um, I think I would just like to, to close this session by saying a huge thanks to our speakers today 
very thought-provoking, big issues and big challenges. And we, we need some big actions to help us deal with this and ways of holding ourselves to account and having those conversations over the years ahead. So I would leave you with one word before we thank the speakers. Um, unfairty, that is the word to take with you for the rest of today, being bold in your discussions ahead. And if we could now just thank the speakers very much for their insightful and fascinating com conversations. And thanks to you all for some excellent questions. I know we haven't got through all of those, so I'll be looking through those with colleagues from Historic Environment Scotland to see how we can respond to those out with this forum.